This is Marshall Abrahams with Evidence for Albine, number 17. This mysterious founding mother of Albion, the old name for Britain, is mentioned by name several times in the British histories, and her migration, um, an integral part of them, has been proved many times archaeologically and now by DNA. For all that, historians in the past have spilt a great deal of ink in denying her existence. William Harrison and John Milton, to name but two, are respectively scornful both of her and of the record. Albine, says Harrison, the imagined daughter of a forged Diocletian. While Milton has uh, but too absurd and too unconscionably gross is that fond invention that wafted hither the fifty daughters of a strange Diocletian king of Syria. Percy Enderby dismisses out of hand the quaint and far-fetched story of the Damozella Albone or Albina, daughter of Diocletian, king of Syria, on the grounds that no authentic writer as yet ever produced any such king to bear sway and government, either over the Assyrians or Assyrians, nor that he had thirty daughters who all slew their husbands. While Harrison, Milton and um, Enderby didn't have access to the Sumerian archaeological record, which really began in the 1920s with Leonard Woolley, uh, and we have to um, bear that in mind, it does, I'm sorry to say, still say more about them than it does about Albine. And I was also bothered that uh, Milton critiquing Hollins Head's chronicles there and Enderby give different numbers of these daughters. While not important in itself, it does suggest that neither of them consulted the Brute or Chronicles of England, which clearly says 33. Then I remembered that there was a Greek legend that has the women of Lemnos being deserted by their husbands for Thracian women and murdering every single man on the island in revenge. This is clearly nonsense and was already hoary with age when it left Lemnos with Brutus's fleet and arrived in Britain three and a half thousand years ago but it is probably at least a partial basis for Diocletian's 33 daughters. Looking still further back, the number probably has some kind of star reference or planetary activity at its source. Um, given the connection of Sirius to Earth, as shown by Robert Temple in the Sirius Mystery, not to mention the similarity in names of Syria, Surrey and Sirius, this seems to be the most likely. My own pet theory, which thanks to Morgan I can now stick to an overland migration, involves the Nebra sky disk with its sun and moon and its 33 dots of Cornish gold representing the constellations of which the Pleiades are the most prominent. What it was doing in Saxony being buried at exactly the right time for Albine's migration is anybody's guess, but I go into the connection between Sumer and Britain in detail in the Great Migrations and this connection is much, much older than I had any idea of. Equally, the Nebra sky disk, although buried in about 1600 BC, is now thought to be much older than that. There is also an, um, a reference in the Mul Apin, which is called Babylonian um, Astronomical Guide, uh, but it's actually based on Sumerian star lore, and it talks of the northern path of Enlil, um, uh, the 33 tracks, I think it is, of the northern path of Enlil. I can't find um, a PDF of the Mulap in to check this, so if I've got this wrong, um, I'd like to know about it. But if it's right, then it's a very um, significant connection between this, these 30, so-called so 33 daughters and... Um, uh, the northern path of Enlil. Wilson and Blackett th speak of the 33 states of the four corners of the earth, um, which was what the Sumerian state was called, but I can't find a source for this. Again, if anybody can help me, it would be very good to have that. So I had to dig deep for information, and I started uh, where Wilson and Blackett started with The Brute, or Chronicles of England. This was edited by Friedrich Brie, who calls her Albine, and says that the first part of his chronicle is, and I quote, a mere translation of the French Bru d'Angleterre. Brie also says that the value of such portions of the narrative as are incapable of external authentication depends on the generally faithful character of the context where it has been so proved. This is an enormously important premise to work from, quite at variance with the modern approach, which is to reject out of hand, without study, anything that is slightly at odds with their beaten tracks. 
Bree's edition of the Brute or the Chronicles of England was originally published for the Early English Text Society by Keegan Paul in 1906 and it's available today in two facsimile volumes from the ever-resourceful Guyan Books. Be warned, though, if you decide to put this invaluable history of England stroke Cloiger in the Welsh or Logrees in Logrian on your shelf, it is written in Mid- Middle English. This Brue d'Angleterre is, or rather was, a poem that's been rendered in translation into prose by a 12th century Norman poet called, I'm tempted to say, Wace, uh, W-A-C-E, but probably, probably pronounced Vas. His name for it was uh, Le Geste or La Geste des Bretons, or Deeds of the Britons, and he is supposed to have based it on Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. That may be so, I'm not really in a position to dispute or confirm this, except to say that there is no mention anywhere of Albine, Albina, in Geoffrey's history. And this is a strange piece of truly crucial information for Vast to have left out, one would have thought. My own guess is that this story was taken by Britons fleeing the comet and its aftermath and persisted in oral form for some centuries before finally being written down and preserved. It is the earliest reference we have to Albine by name and it is therefore correspondingly precious information. Here it is in reasonably modern English, uh, while the screen uh, shows the facsimile from the brute. It befell thus that this Diocletian espoused a gentle damsel that was wonderfully fair, that was his uncle's daughter, Labena, and she loved him as reason would. So he got upon her thirty-three daughters, of which the eldest was called Albine. Eam is Middle English for uncle, and as Mesopotamian alliances were stitched together with marriages, an alliance between Dungi and his first cousin is not at all unlikely. In addition, W and B identify Labana as Labana, and indeed there were Hittite kings at this time with the, uh, with the title of Labana. However, the Phoenician triliteral LBN, which means white, is the most likely source of this name, Labana, without the R, and therefore ultimately Albine. And um, Labana, wife of Diocletian, can be cautiously identified with Taram Oram, Dungi's first queen. This is provable. Uh, Taram Oram stroke Labena was the daughter of Aphil Kin, king of the northern Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian province called Mari. This is a strong and tantalising clue and we will return to it. I'll also come back uh, both to Dungi and his eldest daughter Taram Dungi stroke Albine, but first I just want to add that Brute here is not a reference to Brutus, who's coming to these islands is also recorded uh, Brut is the Welsh British word Brit B R U D, which means chronicle, prognostication, divination, and I hope that helps to legitimate any dowsing activities going on out there. Brewer defines it as a rhyming chronicle, as the Brut d'Angleterre by Vas. Brut is the Romance word Bruit, a rumour, hence a tradition, or a chronicle based on tradition. This word tradition might ring alarm bells, but the kind of academia we're accustomed to today is motivated by a dangerous combination of untrammeled imagination and a dense and impenetrably resistant scepticism which passes for legitimate query. Even in the 12th century, oral tradition was more concerned with passing on the truth and had nothing to do with the sort of fantasy cooked up these days to explain the gaps which our British histories fill so well. Brutus is connected etymologically to Brit, but I'll deal with that elsewhere. I say all this uh, in order to show you why I'm quite happy to rely on um, this amazing reference to Albine in the Chronicle of England. The period of oral tradition and chronologies on which I lean, together with the genealogy of Yestin Gorgon for the Great Migrations, and indeed all my work in this area, is cited by Wilson and Blackett in the Trojan War of 650 BC. It does not mention Albine by name, but it says, From the time that the Cimbric nation first arrived in the island of Britain to the period of Ephrauk the Mighty, the son of Mumbia, the son of Madauk, 500 years, according to the preserved memorials and information of the wise. 
Wilson and Blackett, with their access to genealogies and therefore dates, have worked out that the arrival in Britain of Albine and the Kimbrick, or Sumeric, nation was 1567 BC. It is true that this is not the only date they give, but when I sat down with Percy Enderby's Cambria Triumphans to reconcile his dates with W. and um, Wilson and Blackett's given genealogies, this date of 1567 BC is the most possible. I have therefore calculated Ephraq's dates as 1067 to 1007 BC. Hollinshead's king list neatly fills the gap from Ephraq back to Samothes, with Albion, whom I have equated with Albine, about a third of the way along. It will also be seen that I have completely rejected orthodox chronology. Thanks to Joseph Scaliger, or Scallywaliger as I call him, the events of history were wrenched out of context 500 years ago to fit a preconceived time frame. Wilson and Blackett have shown spectacularly, and particularly with their lists of Roman emperors, who correlate even to their names to British kings, that following an orthodox chronology is asking for trouble. To my mind, a massive metalworking migration occurring from Sumer and turning up at much the same time in Britain is far better evidence to work from. Until academics stop mangling scientific gifts such as radiocarbon dating and dendrochronology, we, had do, we would do better to concentrate on making sense of the history and allowing events to fall into their proper contexts and sequence, however unused we may be uh, to this. Only then will we begin to see when those events really occurred. The Reverend R. W. Morgan in the British Cymru has the following. For a long time after the subsiding of the deluge, the Cymru dwelt in the summer land between the Sea of Afiz and Defrabeni. The land being exposed to sea floods, they resolved under the guidance of Hugh Gadarn to seek again the White Island of the West. That again is very significant. The White Island of the West, where their father, Doivan, had built the ship of Nevith Navnivian. Uh, these people we have met in um, my two Noah um, videos. Uh, the, the mention of Hugh Gadarn is most interesting, as my own work has shown that the migration of Albine is contemporaneous, not only with that of the biblical Abraham, but also with Hugh Gadarn, with whom Abraham is sometimes identified. Um, the notion that there could have been three such massive migrations from Ur in Sumeria at the same time is simply not credible as I hope to show in The Great Migrations, and which I'm, I'm giving a digest of here, these are one and the same. The summer land mentioned by Morgan is patently Sumeria, while the Sea of Afiz is the Persian Gulf, also known to this day as the Gulf of Fars. And I'll explain Defraveni in a moment, because I'm jolly proud of it. The Colbrin, uh, Book of Origins 6.1, has... Great Hugh, the strong arm, chief of the well-born ones, he was descended from Sisuda, known to us as Noah. He was bright-bearded, blue-eyed, but not over-tall. He was the bronze-bound ruler of warriorful Heva. Uh, that might have a connection to Heva in uh, Kent, or the ultimately the English surname Heva Percy. I don't know yet. Uh, uh, which is described as a place lying out in the shallow seas eastward of Britain, so post-Atlantis then, with a many-moted white castle and high-coloured walls. Watch out for reference to, to these in my forthcoming um, Atlantis epic. I hope I'm not to take too long with it. This was the seat from which he ruled oft-flooded Idavrabandi. That's how it appears in the Colbrin. And we see straight away that Defrabeni is a corruption of Odavrabandi, which is so Welsh stroke British in appearance that I got to work as soon as I found it. And I came up with the following Dyfra, D Y F R A, is an old word for water, while Pandy derives not from Pandy meaning a fulling mill, which I think is much too precise and restric restricted a definition, but from Pantleo, which means to dent, dimple, depress, or sink. And I found that Pantley, P-A-N-T-L-E, is hollow. So oft flooded Idavra Bandi, stroke Defra Bene, is actually Idavra Pantley, the oft flooded water hollow, or the marshes of Ur in Sumer, in other words. This could easily also apply to the Fens of England. 
Here I contend a large part of this migration, having taken ship on the last leg of its journey, landed on the shores of the Wash and elsewhere, and built the first Troy on the Gog Magog Hills in Cambridgeshire. I'll come back to this too, but first I want to try and tie up Albine Albina to Taram Dungi, Princess of Sumer, as she is explicitly stated in an ox of one's own by T. M. Sharlak to be a daughter of Dungi of Ur. Dungi of Ur, second king of the third dynasty, reigned for 48 years. Oh, by the way, um, I've done a lot of work on why Wilson and Blackett are quite correct to say that Dungi is the proper name, not Shulgi, which is the modern academic rendering. No, I won't go into it here, but um, trust them, they're right. Dungi of Ur, second king of the third dynasty, reigned for 48 years and had several wives. Star references notwithstanding, it is therefore actually quite possible for him to have had the 33 daughters, of which Alban was the eldest. If she was the eldest, it is fair to assume, as already stated, that she was the daughter of his first wife, Taram Uram, called Labena in the Brut. Taram Uram was almost certainly the mother also of Dungi's heir, Bur Sin, called today Amar Sin. I don't know why, I haven't looked into that. Dungi cemented a great many political alliances by marrying off his daughters, and Taram Dungi, the eldest, was married to Shuda Bani, king of a neighbouring province called Bashime. Um, now, this place has actually been found. Uh, it's called Tel Abu Shija today, which is almost exactly the same pronunciation. Its deity was called Shuda or Shija, and this turns out to be of supreme importance in our quest because Shude in Sumerian is prayer or blessing, while Sud is to sink or drown. Um, and the name Shuda has left its mark at the very foot of Troy's walls in the name of a village called Shudi Camps. Dungi recorded his reign. Um, by uh, in what has come to be known as a list called year names. In other words, he marked a year by its most significant event. The marriages of two daughters make it into the year names. Taram Dungi, possibly because she was married off before Dungi succeeded his father of, as king, is not on the list. How Dungi, king of Syria, equates with Breeze Diocletian, king of Surrey, uh, is not so far-fetched or even plain impossible as it might first appear. Getting to the bottom of this was an astonishing journey and is worth a video of its own. Um, if one does not know of the relationship between an acorn and an oak leaf, one might be forgiven for assuming that a relationship is impossible. Knowledge and observation are all. We don't yet know what caused the Albine, Abraham, Hugh Gadarn migration, but many people will know that in the Quran, Abraham is described as a man of Ur, an exemplary leader, a monotheist, a man of truth, that's most important, and a youth who broke in pieces the idols that his father Azar sculpted. This part of the world was as engulfed in war then as it is now, and in addition a cataclysm called the Bronze Age Collapse has also been mooted as the cause of the general upheaval of the time. I find this less convincing myself, uh, for reasons stated in The Great Migrations. Wilson and Blackett say that there was a dire necessity for control over supplies of tin for bronze weapons. Whether that need was enough to uproot an entire civilization to the world's major tin-producing island, Britain in other words, 3,000 miles to the north, remains to be seen. In any event, the migrating peoples under Abraham, stroke um, Hugh Gadarn, stroke, uh, stroke Albine, stop on their journey north at Mari, and the kingdom of Mari was ruled by Apil Kin, uncle of Taram Dungi, who became known as Albine. Albine's migration has been understood to mean a fleet which sailed all the way from the Middle East, but Morgan describes, at least at the outset, not a seaborne invasion, but an overland migration. They journeyed westward, he says, towards the setting sun, being many in number and men of great heart and strength, Kedian, mighty ones, giants. I've probably mispronounced that, sorry. Um, and this is um, most likely the source in Holland's Head's King's List of the name Albion the Giant. They came in sight of the Alps, and then part of their migration diverged southward. These are the Cymri, or the Umbri, of Italy, forefathers of the Etruscan culture. 
This explains why 900 years later, the half of the Cymru that migrated from Anatolia in about 650 BC to escape the famine there were welcomed in Italy and why they settled down so well. Brutus's fleet was absorbed in a similarly friendly fashion when he arrived in Britain. The three Pacific tribes received their countrymen from the east as brethren, as Morgan puts it, drawing on Welsh-British records. Pacific here means peaceful. It doesn't refer to the Pacific Ocean, although the meaning is the same. The others, says Morgan, um, consisting of the three tribes of the Cymru, the Brython and the Loigruis, crossed the Alps. Along either side of the Alps, near the sea, part of the Loigruis settled. These are the Ligurians of Italy and Gaul. Pursuing their course still further, they crossed the River of Edis, the Slow River, the Rough River, the Bright River respectively the Rhone, the Arar, the Garonne and the Loire, till they reached Guasquin, or Gascony, the Vineland. Thence they turned northward, and part of the Britons settled in a land they named Hlidau Arimorica, I hope I've got that right, the land of expansion on the upper sea, Armorica in other words. The Cymri, then I, I've put this in uh, italics because it's most important. The Cymri still held onward until they saw the cliffs of the White Island. Then they built ships, not until note, and in them passed over the hazy ocean, the Mortosh, or Tauch, the Colbrin calls it Mortosh, and took possession of the island. As Wilson and Blackett have established, the Cymric Sumeric people took their alphabet with them wherever they went which is why Colbren can be used to read Etruscan and the Raetian or Alpine language called Romanche. Morgan continues, They sent to the Brythons in Hledau and to the Loigruis on the continent, and to as many as came they gave the east and the north of the island, and the Cymri dwelt in the west. These three tribes were of one race, origin and speech. The substitution of Sumeric for Cymric makes the joint origin even clearer. Waddle states that the Dean Hoffman tablet establishes that a large proportion of the words used by the Aryan Moors or Amorites so early as about 4000 BC are radically identical in sound and meaning with common words in our modern English. Waddle equates Amorite with Sumerian. Um, I start paged Dean Hoffman tablet and came up with nothing. Then I googled it and was told rather sinisterly, that unusual traffic had been detected on my system. It might have another name now. Here it is from Model's invaluable book, The Phoenician Origin of Britons. If anybody knows what's happened to this or what it's what name it's going by, please tell me. There's the background so far into Tarandungi before she became known as Albine. Lots more work to do yet, but this is the first ever serious job of investigation into this mysterious woman. As far as the change from Taram Dungi to Albine goes, we have seen that LBN, the Phoenician triliteral for white. Since names such as Lebanon and Alaba, the Gaelic name for Scotland, are derived and Alp is also connected, my guess is that this is the opposite of Abyss. Albine's god was Apollyon, the lord of the Abyss, and there is abundant evident, evidence of his presence in Britain. As far as the vexed question of giants goes, not only did they exist, as evidenced by the Smithsonian's habit of hiding the enormous bones found from time to time and presented hopefully to them for analysis and explanation, but if the evidence of the platoon of American soldiers in, Afga in, Afga Aga sorry, in Afghanistan uh, quite recently is to be accepted, they still do. I've put a link below to a YouTube video on this. Um, in the Great Migrations, I've, uh, I have drawn a link between John Milton's History of Britain. He, uh, he relates three items of information in connection with his name, um, Albion. Albion was a giant. He sailed the seas. He had 33 sons. We put this, uh, these clues together with what the Brute of England says about Albine. First, the name, Albine. Secondly, she finds Britain except, empty except for giants. And thirdly, she sailed the seas to arrive here. Fourthly, she's accompanied by 33 sisters. Add to that 
uh, the roughly correct uh, number of generations at an average of 24.7 years per generation over 500 years between her and Ibraicus Ephrag, and we are left, I think, with a garbled memory of a distant truth. Of the two horrible giants in Albion who are said to be descended from Albion and her retinue, two are named in the Brute or the Chronicles of England. One is Locherigan, which sounds Irish or Scots, um, but is actually a phonetic and metathetic rendering of Loigrian, and Gog Magog. If we accept that Magog, this is taken from the Great Migrations, by the way, I haven't really explained here who Magog is, except that he's in the King List, and his name is most important. Um, if we accept that Magog gave his name to this range of hills, Gog Magog Hills in, in uh, Cambridgeshire, we are left with another inescapable uh, conclusion that this juxtaposition of the Albine legend with the very name of Gog Magog, as well as that of the name of Albion with giants in Hollinshead's list, as critiqued by Milton, means that she had already been linked with this area when the Brute of England were first written down. This supports my theory that the British, fleeing the comet, took this ancient foundation story with them to what is now the north of France, where it was recorded in the 12th century by the Norman poet Vass. As for evidence of her presence in this country, the question is not where to start, but what to leave out. At home next the sea, on the Norfolk coast, near Old Hunston, there are two timber circles which have been dubbed, uh, apparently erroneously, Sea Henge. I believe they're not henges. Um, I'm not sure why not, but there you are. One has now been removed for safety. Why not the other one as well? But the one remaining is constructed of, constructed of 55 posts and it has the stump of an oak tree upside down in the centre. I believe that this has to do with Earth's previous habit of shifting her poles, but there is not room to go into the significance here. The circles were constructed tellingly on what used to be a salt marsh in 2049 BC or so they say. Um, I think that's too um, early myself. Um, and at least 50 bronze axes were used. This area is on the southernmost tip of the wash. Chroma, obviously a Cymru word, is along the coast to the east. Pedder's Way actually begins at home next to the sea. It passes two half-moon plantations, one on each side, and a place called Summerfield, and it links up with the Icknield Way at Thetford, and there is another half-moon plantation not far away at Netsfield. The Icknield Way skirts Troy itself, then passes through Trojan country to the south. Pedder, incidentally, is supposed to be derived from the Latin pedister, but it is more likely, I think, to be pedwar the Welsh-British word for four, but to have anything to do with either peddlers or pedestrians, and Dungi, Taram Dungi's father, was king of the four corners of the world. Whether the fleet brought them all the way from Suma, which I don't think it did, or whether, as Morgan says, they simply crossed the channel and the Mortauch, the Mortosh, the hazy sea, where else might Taram Dungi have landed with her huge fleet? It would make sense for her to have landed flotillas at intervals along the coastline, in support of this, the whole extent of the south coast of England is awash with names associated with the Taram Dungi, or Albine, as we will call her from now on. Dengi, or Dengi, Dengi Marshes and Dengi Flats are just off the Essex coast. In Kent, we find Dungeness next to Lyd, and Camber Sands. Camber is obviously Cymru. In Dorset, there's Dungi Head and Kimmeridge, Cymru Ridge. Uh, in Devon, we find Dunks Green, Dunkerton and Dunkery Head. We've already mentioned Cromer in Norfolk, and there's a Homer's Field in Suffolk. I think I've already mentioned Green Homerton in another video as well, which is just to the north of London. Um, uh, there's a very old house indeed, just north of Romford in Essex, called Albines, and Romford itself is a most important name. Both Dungy, according to Wilson and Blackett, and his distant descendant, Convelin, were buried with crystal balls in their graves to represent the pituitary glands. Convelin uh, is buried at Lexton, now a suburb of Colchester. I don't believe this is um, it's possible to visit this. It's uh, in the garden of a private house, as I recall. Elsewhere there is the Dunge at Brosley, just south of Telford. <coughs> 
we've already seen that the deity of Bashime, called Shuda, is commemorated in Shudi camps at the southeastern foot of the walls of Troy. We also find the Shud element in Shud Hill, a suburb of Manchester, also Shut in many place names, um, as well as Shut spelt S-H-W-T in Bridge End. Further north we have Macalpin, which is the royal name of a, um, a dynasty of Scotland's kings. It means son of Alpin, Albine. And remembering that Suma was also Shinar, we have Shinner's Bridge near Totnes in Devon. Totnes being downstream from Dartmeet, where the Ark was built, and the limit of the Dart's tidal reach has been a crucially important place for centuries. Where the Isle of Thanet, um, at the easternmost tip of Kent, uh, it was called the Isle of Ruin by the British, where it used to be divided from the mainland by the River Wonsum, is a crossing place called Saar, S-A-R-R-E. In Scotland, again, we find Loch Shin, Strath Shinnery, Loch Saar, S-Y-R-E, Shinness, and Glenarmin and Benarmin, all in Sutherland, I think. Uh, and that neatly leads us to Armenia Street, or Ermin Street as we know it, Brewer describes Ermin Street almost accurately as one of the four great public ways made in England, and I'll put this in brackets and whisper it, by the Romans. But it is his entry for Ermin or Hermin, above Ermin Street in his Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, that gives the clue, deriving the name from Armenia itself and giving Armin as a preferable spelling. Skeet derives the word from the French Ermin through Old High German Harmo, the ermine stoat or weasel. Ermine, um, a fur of black tail tips on white pelts, the stoat's winter coat, has been worn for centuries by royalty and nobility, and we recall that the colour of Logris, the moon country, are black and silver. In addition, Harmo is very akin to Cymru. DNA studies uh, based on Russian scientific studies, according to Robert Sepper, are showing more and more that Armenia has been crucial as a reseeding ground for the world after countless catastrophes going back many millennia. Um, and Morgan opens his book, The British Cymru, or Britons of Cambria, with a description of the geological importance of Armenia. Albine's uh, ma migrating peoples, um, therefore, descended from Sisuda stroke Noah, was simply returning home to Britain after ha having settled the summer, summer land, Suma, after the flood. Troy was built in the Helmsman's Corner, the southwest, where Ermine Street me meets the Icknield Way. What could be more natural than that Albine should have extended the road that leads all the way to London Stone, in a straight line, north until it met the Fossway at Lincoln? At some point I will do a video on the four royal roads of Britain. Back to Scotland, this time to the southwest, where we find several Urs, Loch Ur, uh, we're all in Galloway now, uh, Loch Ur, Old Bridge of Ur, these are all spelt U -R -R, -R, Hoch of Ur, Moat of Ur, River Ur, and Ur Water. Uh, we also find, sorry, Ur, we also find um, 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 Enoch, several Enochs, but um, I haven't made a note of them, it's just occurred to me. Uh, I think there's Loch Enoch as well. Um, in the north of England, we have Ara and Arul Fell. Then back to Galloway, we have Loch Dungeon, Round Loch of the Dungeon, and Chanel Water. While in Angus, there's actually Padden Aram, which I've driven through. Uh, Abraham stopped in Padden Aram, as well as at Murray. I've also found Shiny Row, Shincliffe, and many, many others. In French, Le Dungeon means both dungeon and or keep stroke tower, just as a dyke can be both wall and ditch, dyke and ditch are the same word. I've included dungeon words because, strange as it might sound, they have a great deal to do with dungi. Dungeon and dyke are therefore the positive and negative of the same thing, very suitable for a language spoken by a people whose god was lord of the abyss and whose queen was known as Albine, which is the same as Alp, its direct opposite. According to where one places the vowels in this trilateral LBN, it is uh, variously Lebanon, Alban and Albine. And finally, most people, we're still in Scotland, most people will know that the fissure in Scotland along which, which Loch Ness runs is called the Great Glen. 
Loch Ness is now known to be almost 900 feet deep, twice the depth of the North Sea, and at least in this picture, which I'm showing, is an almost perfect V-shape. Uh, we've seen that Albine brought her god Apollyon with her, the Lord of the Abyss. Behind Loch Ness is Loch Vor, the Great Loch. Into it runs River E, and E is house or temple in Sumerian. And finally, the Bonbush, which I've been saving until last. The other name for the Great Glen is Glen Albin. I finish with a plea. Ross, in a recent video, you mentioned that Albin has possibly been found in the Bible. Please, where do I find Albin in the Bible? Well, um, um, that's it. Uh, as ever, a warm um, welcome backwards. It's all these Alps and Abysses uh, to uh, ever, all subscribers. And um, thank you so much for watching and listening. Please keep your comments coming. I find them absolutely fascinating. Sometimes you clever people um, show me a whole avenue of something that I've completely ignored or haven't seen at all. So please keep the comments coming. And thank you very much indeed. Until the next time. Goodbye.